Hi, it's exciting to be here and a little bit scary. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is based on um, a book that I, um, I got to uh, got off the internet, of course, and it's called The Seven Myths About Education. And this woman in the UK um, wrote this book because she had been a teacher and she looked at all of the things that she was being trained to teach and not, you know, and how to teach. And then she went and looked up the, the neuroscience behind it and realized that a lot of these things are diametrically opposed. And so, so my presentation is going to be about those seven myths, but more importantly, what I want you to take away from this is much broader than that. The first one is that one of the biggest problems that we have in education, I believe, is the standardization. Um, and so there are things that, that we hit upon that we'll say, well, that's a really good idea, but it's a really good idea within a certain context. And that doesn't mean that that devalues another idea that may be different, even in that same context or in a different context. And so there are some things that, that we're really pushing right now that if they're used in isolation would be a bad thing, but if they're used you know, with other things may not be. So bear that in mind, but this is what she's come up with in neuroscience. And um, I can tell you that all of these things tend to be um, a focus right now. And a lot of the things that are occurring in education are occurring without the benefit of any sort of evidence or pilot testing. You, you know, what happens is people will attend a conference, kind of like this one, um, and they'll get a great idea and they'll write a book about it and then everybody implements it. And, and it serves a purpose, but it may not be, you know, in its totality. So I'm going to start out with what is the purpose of education. Um, I loved one of the definitions about to push you beyond where you are. Was that yours? <laughs> However she said it, she said it really well. Um, but there's been a big shift in what education was about. What, once upon a time in the 1890s, when you talk to people about what a uh, well-educated person was, it was more about um, their character, things that they could develop, who they were as an individual. And today it's more the culture of personality versus this culture of character. Um, we've focused a lot more on grit versus academics. And again, not that, that the grit things are bad or that we don't want those things to be developed in our kids, but that the focus of our public education system specifically is focused more on grit than on academics. My own daughter was graded this last year on her grit as opposed to her academics in one of her classes. Um, skills versus knowledge um, and workforce versus enlightenment. Uh, because there's so much corporate involvement in education these days, there's an awful lot of emphasis on the skills that our kids will need to be successful in the workforce. And you hear a lot about how, you know, the jobs that, that our kids are going to have, they, they don't exist, we don't know what they're going to be, so we got to focus on skills. Um, but the skills that they're talking about may not be these skills that are dealing with the culture of character. They may be dealing with the culture of personality as opposed to this, this character. And again, grit versus academics. Um, so we've kind of devalued the worth of, of, of searching for truth in favor of getting a job, I would argue. Um, so anyway, I will uh, proceed with that. Um, as an example, I found this really quite interesting. Um, in the 1890s, these were some of the characteristics that were used to describe people um, that were well-educated. They talked a lot about duty, work, honor, ma uh, morals, manners, and integrity. Um, and then about 1920, we started to shift and we saw things that were more of, the, a person was fascinating, magnetic, attractive. And I recently read a book where this woman talked about how we, we are elevating the personality type as being someone to emulate as opposed to individual character and who they are. And these days, it's, it's the, if you're an extrovert, if you're you know, magnetic and, and you draw people to you, then that's seen as an advantage. But what you know inside your head isn't nearly as, as important. And I'm not saying that one or the other is necessarily bad. It's just that we're valuing one over the other instead of allowing and, and cultivating all the different personality types that exist in children. Um, so these are the seven myths um, from, from the book, The Seven Myths About Education, and I'll read through them very quickly. The first one is that facts prevent understanding. We hear a lot about critical thinking. We all want our kids to think critically, um, but there's a shift from learning actual 
knowledge and content to more ethereal, abstract thinking about things, and that it doesn't matter so much what you're thinking about as long as you're thinking abstractly. The second one is that teacher-led instruction is passive. So you hear a lot about being the, the guide on the side, not the stage on, sage on the stage. Um, but I would argue that there are some, some topics and, ex and experiences that lend themselves more to discovery and some more to being shown how to do it and, and, and being actually lectured on. Um, the third one is the 21st century fundamentally changes everything. Back to this reference to jobs that, you know, the, the jobs that my kids will have, they, they don't exist now. Honestly, the job I have now didn't exist when I was in high school either, but I was in high school in the dark ages. Um, but the, 20, you know, the way that the human brain functions, the way we are at human nature has not changed. And so the fact that it's the 21st century really doesn't change who we are as, as, as a human race. The fourth one is you can always just look it up. You can Google it. The fifth one, we should teach transferable skills. Um, and that projects and activities are the best way to learn under all circumstances, and that teaching knowledge is the same as indoctrination. And so we need to not teach, you know, concrete knowledge because we're indoctrinating our kids. Um, so I wanted to just give you an, an example. This uh, the myth one is facts prevent understanding. So. Um, there is uh, some neuroscience about the difference between working memory and long-term memory. And uh, working memory is pretty static from individual to individual. And I'll, I'll give you an example. If I ask you to multiply 19 times 27, you could probably do that in your head. I, you may not want to, but you probably could. But if I extend that out to three or four digits and ask you to multiply three or four digits together, um, you're gonna have a much hard, harder time doing that unless it's something like 1,000 times 2,000. I could do that one. But it's because of the slots in your working memory. Again, about five to seven slots in your working memory. Long-term memory evidently is, is we, we haven't found a limit to long-term memory. And um, what we're being told is that you don't need to have stuff in that long-term memory because you can Google it or for whatever other reason. But it limits your ability to think and analyze right in the here and now, if you have to bring something up, bring it into long-term memory, that takes one of those slots if, or in short-term memory. If you have it in long-term memory, it's just a part of who you are and your, your, your thought process. And so it doesn't take up any of those spaces that you're using for actively reasoning and thinking through. So um, you've had this up here for a while. I'm gonna give you five seconds. Start to memorize those letters, if you would. Okay, who wants to volunteer to go through and say what those were? Anybody? X, everybody got X? Okay, now look at it this way. These are the same letters. See, can you remember those now? Okay, so this is, this is one of those things with, with short-term and long-term memory because CNN and PhD have a place in our long-term memory. When we see CNN, that takes up just a very small amount of our working memory because it's already there with all the associations in our brain. And the brain doesn't remember CNN, it remembers the concept, it remembers the idea. And so CNN is stored exactly the same way, whether it's as a thought of CNN or CNN, but this one takes less memory because it's just one idea as opposed to three letters. So I, th I thought that was really quite interesting. Um, so I'll skip through that because I put it in there twice. So then along with that, um, what we see a lot is that we don't want to we don't want to do drill and kill. And you hear drill and kill, and it's a very negative, and it comes from those of us who sat in those classrooms with those teachers that were really boring, and everything was just painful, and you had to memorize like every date and it was awful. But that doesn't say that we shouldn't learn things by memory. And so I'm, I'm a self-described math geek. I have a math degree. I'm a computer programmer. And um, I had to learn the times tables when I was a kid. My mother made me do it. Um, and I hated it on some days. But I was unable, I would have been unable to do what I'm doing and to know what I know and to see the patterns in life if I had not been 
you know, basically forced to memorize the times tables. Now, that, I had great teachers that made it fun and interesting, and that's true of virtually anything. If you have a teacher that is excited about whatever it is they're teaching, then they can bring that to life, and they can give that energy to you, and you want to learn it. Um, and when, when we think about learning, somehow we separate learning from all the other learning, you know, academic learning. Um, I also play the piano, but I have to practice in order to get good at things. And there aren't tasks that you do that you don't get good at without practice. You know, very few of us are born magically being able to play in the symphony orchestra. You have to practice, you have to be good. So with, with academics, there are certain things that you do have to know, and especially young ages with young children, they love to memorize things. They love to watch Finding Nemo a zillion times over and commit it to memory. And so Dr. Willingham here, he is a neuropsychologist, um, and he says it is virtually impossible to become proficient at a mental task without extended practice. And what I see going on in our schools is that we're trying to bypass that actual taking something and learning it and, and, and committing it to memory. Um, again, not everything needs to be committed to memory, but there are certain foundational things that you have to have committed to memory or it prevents you from advancing on. Um, here's a really interesting graph. I don't know how well you can see it. This was a study that was done. Um, again, I loved it because it's dealing with math, but it's algebra, basic algebra, and using basic algebra. The bottom line are the people who took one algebra course and then how, many, you know, how much of that knowledge re was retained over the course of how many years it had been since they had taken algebra. So I will confess part of my age, I took Algebra one in the late 70s. And um, if that was all I had took, I would not remember very much of it. But then the next line, you'll see this is more than just Algebra one, and it goes down kind of the same trajectory, but um, there's a higher retention rate for just having an additional course or uh, beyond Algebra one. The third line up is Calculus. If you took Calculus, that doesn't degrade nearly so much. And what's interesting, if you can't see it, that outermost line is 55 years later. So after 55 years, if you took calculus, you still know about 75%, 80% of your algebra skills. And it's, again, because the practice, and it's not just doing the same practice, it's the practice and advancing on to those skills. The top line is if you took any math beyond calculus, it's almost a straight line. It goes up and comes back down. It's almost a straight line that at 55 years, you know almost 100% of your algebra that you knew when you first took that post thing. So I'm going too long because this stuff, I love this stuff. So um, anyway, the point is that there are things that you need to commit to memory and there are things that you learn by practice, but you don't have to practice it in the same way. You can expand upon that, as you see with this calculus thing. When you're taking calculus, you're doing algebra, but you're not just learning the algebra, you're going beyond and you're extending it. So myth two is that self-discovery is better. And there are some things where that is true, and there are some ages where um, it lends itself better to self-discovery. But to throw kids into the deep end of the swimming pool without any sort of instruction is really counterintuitive. And that's a lot of what we're doing now. We're trying to design lesson plans that help kids, again, you know, discover the Pythagorean <coughs> theorem or you know, Newton's third law of motion without any sort of preparation. And you can use some of those things to build upon, but they have to have a baseline understanding of what you're, you're talking about or it doesn't make any sense. So um, this quote is, is, is it possible for pupils to independently learn all the facts that they will need through well-designed learning experiences that involve minimal teacher interaction. And, and the proponents of this argue correctly that the aim of schooling is for pupils to be able to work, learn, and solve problems independently, but they assume incorrectly that the best method for achieving that is to always learn independently. And if you think about the things that you do with your children in, in life, a lot of times when it's brand new, you sit down and you show them how to do it. And then, you know, as they, it, it, it's kind of a, a dance with how much they know and how much you show and it, until they become independent. There was one study that was done with soccer players in the UK, and um, they found that kids who practiced the skills of soccer 
for two years more than the kids who were playing the full-on games, they ended up winning more games later on because they had worked so much on those basic skills that they became automatic. And so again, it's, we, we're, we've switched and we used to value, you know, it's probably a pendulum. We used to be maybe too focused on the memorization and now we're too focused on we don't need to memorize anything. And it's probably a balance, but there is an actual need for, for memorization and understanding and being shown how to do things. Um, along this line is we want to teach with the Common Core, it's a lot of, we want to teach kids to think like a mathematician, we want them to think like a scientist. But a scientist has years upon years upon years of experience and learning before they start out with their experiments and their hypotheses. And when they start with their hypotheses, they pretty are much are pretty sure where they're going to go with it. They're doing the experiment just to confirm what they already think is going to happen, and sometimes they're, they're amazed, but like, how many of you here have kids that have done science fair projects and you hate them? Um, I'm one of those. The kids, a lot of times with the science fair projects, there are a couple of kids where it works out really well for them, but a lot of them, they just don't have a baseline minimum knowledge and understanding to be able to construct something that is of interest. So, um, Controlled experiments almost uniformly indicate that when dealing with novel information, and that's important, learners should be explicitly shown what to do and how to do it. And that when students learn science in classrooms with pure discovery methods and minimal feedback, which is a lot of the, the pushback is they can learn from their peers but not from the teacher, um, they often become lost and frustrated and their confusion can lead to misconceptions. Um, myth three is 21st century skills. 21st century changes everything. If you go online and look up 21st century skills, you'll read about the four C's, creativity, communication, critical thinking, collaboration. I don't think there's anybody here that doesn't think those are important, wonderful, exciting things. But it's the way that it's being done and it's at the expense of actual knowledge. So you, as long as you're creative, it doesn't matter if you're learning something. Um, specifically. Um, as long as you're communicating, that's good, but you don't have to be communicating about anything. And, um, and this is what's really important about it. The idea is that things are changing so rapidly that all knowledge is transient. And that's not really true. Um, and this Ben Goldacre, he says that while this idea that things are changing rapidly is true at the bleeding edges of various research fields, it's worth bearing in mind that Archimedes has been right about why things float for a couple of millennia. He also understood why levers work and Newtonian physics will probably be right about the behavior of snooker balls forever. He's British, I have no idea what a snooker <laughs> ball is. But, but if you stop and think about it, <coughs> truth and knowledge doesn't change that much over the millennia. So this is a great one from Isaac Asimov. In mathematics, there is no significant correction, only extension. Once the Greeks had developed the deductive method, they were correct in what they did, correct for all time, eternal truths. Euclid was incomplete, and his work has been extended enormously, but it has not had to be corrected. His theorems are, every one of them, valid to this day. So then Mr. Krista Dulu, the author of the Seven Myths book, she says the irony, of course, is that the newer the idea, the more likely it is to become obsolete. If something has proven itself valuable over 5,000 years, probably will be good tomorrow and the next day and the next day after that. But if it's only had value in the last 10 or 20 years, we don't know that that's going to have value 100 years from now. And her example here is great. Microfiche readers and mini disc players have more chance of becoming obsolete than the alphabet and the numerical system. And so in our society today with 21st century skills, we tend to focus more, you know, and this goes back to the emphasis on technology. Technology isn't bad, but if we focus our kids too much on technology and, and not so much on the classics, on, on, on the things of value that have shown that they have been of value over all these many years, then we're kind of giving them the raw end of the deal. Because we don't know, you know, I mean, when was the last time you upgraded your laptop? Um, you know, I mean, I learned, I learned to type on WordPerfect on the DOS thing, right? I'm not using that anymore. But I still use the alphabet every day. I still use the number system every day. And I'm still really glad that I read Huckleberry Finn when I was 15 years old. 
Uh, as a subset of that, myth, myth three, collaboration. And again, collaboration is great. We hear again in the workforce that everybody needs teamwork and collaboration and it's all wonderful. But we're losing the individual in this idea of groupthink and collaboration. And um, I believe our first speaker talked about the amygdala and the, the, one of the books that I read talked about the pain of independence. And um, if you take people and you give them information and, and quiz them on it, they have a much higher likelihood of getting the right answers when they work independently than if you put them in a room of people and you purposely put people in the room to answer incorrectly. And the example I give to the, the young girls that I work with in my church um, is, so you're in a room and I ask you, who was the first president of the United States? And you're the only person in the room that isn't in on this joke. And I point to Risha over here and she says, Abraham Lincoln. And I point to Renee and she says, oh yeah, it was Abraham Lincoln. And then I point to Deverell and he says, yeah, Abraham Lincoln. And after enough time of hearing Abraham Lincoln, you start to go, I thought it was George Washington. Can I call a friend? And I believe that Studio C did a great parody of this. But it's based on actual science that when we are in a group, we think with the group. And that's great as long as the group is thinking correctly, but what if they're not? And the few people, when they do the MRIs, the few people who stand up and are independent and don't go along with the group, they have heightened activity in the amygdala, which is the center of fear and shame. And they associate this with the pain of independence. So the concern with focusing on collaboration at such a young age with children is we're not allowing them to develop to be independent thinkers and to learn things on their own regard, but they're being taught to go along with the crowd. And certainly for a kid, I was very, very shy. This is not something I would have ever done as a kid, stand up in front of people and be videotaped. Um, very, very shy, and I, I mean, if I knew the right answer, I was never the kid that was raising my hand. I was always the one in the back going, yeah, okay, I got that one right. Different personalities, true, but again, you don't wanna be the one out there as, as the kid saying, um, no, it was George Washington. Even if you know you're right, you might just sit there and go, well, I'm gonna put George Washington on my paper, but. Anyway, so this quote down here is from Steve Wozniak, the inventor of Apple computers. I grew up in Cupertino, California, so I kind of have an affinity. He went to my rival high school. Um, he says, most inventors and engineers I've met are like me. They're shy and they live in their heads. They are almost like artists, and some of them are. And artists work best alone. I don't believe that anything really revolutionary has been invented by committee. So, and, um, so it, it's not to say that we always have to work alone or independently. It's just that we need to have that time carved out to allow us that, that individuality and that expression. Um, myths four and six, I'm gonna group together, Google. Um, I went to a conference recently in Salt Lake. It was March of this year. It was uh, sponsored by BYU's um, education department. And every um, seminar that I attended said we shouldn't be teaching anything you can look up on Google. So that is what we are teaching our teachers. If it's on Google, you don't need to learn it. You don't need to memorize it. Who was the first president of the United States? Abraham Lincoln. You don't need to know because you can Google it and say it was George Washington. But you can't function in society without a certain baseline knowledge of what's going on in the world. Um, the other one associated with this is project-based learning. And that's not, again, to say that you can't have you know, chemistry labs and that they're hands-on learning. You do want that. And at different ages and for certain things, you do want that. But most of the shift that you're seeing now when they talk about we need to shift standards and we need to shift pro professional development, it's to discover the Pythagorean theorem. It is to discover Newton's third law of motion instead of you know, using that as maybe a, a follow-up or, yeah, now we've studied Newton's third law, now let's see it in action is usually the better way. You start with the concrete and you move to the abstract and certainly with very, very young children, their brains don't develop to abstract thought until it starts maybe about 12, if I understand correctly. Again, I'm a math geek, so don't take any of that with more than a grain of salt. So everything that we're seeing in school is focused on project-based and discovery learning. Again, to the detriment 
of teachers showing you how to do it. So some of, I, I had a neighbor that was talking about her kids in math class. And they'd come home and they'd say, how do I do this problem? And, and her, she'd say, I'd ask them, well, how, didn't your teacher show you how to do it? Isn't it in your notes? And they're like, no, the teacher never showed me how to do it. And, you, you know, what are you going to do? Okay, I'm going I, it's way too much. All right, the next one is teach transferable skills. Skills are context-based. The things we know, it's based on the context. And if I can think critically about math, it doesn't mean that I can do a literary analysis in a critical way. So read this through quickly. You understand every one of the words in there. Procedure is simple. You arrange items into different group. One pile may be sufficient. Um, that otherwise, you know, it's important not to overdo things. That's it. Better to do two things at once than, than, than too many. Anyone have any idea what that means? No. Absolutely not. Sorting laundry. See how context is important? Once I say it's sorting laundry, and then you read through that, you go, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. They've actually done studies. Kids who are bad readers reading stuff they're interested in, they read better. Okay? Context is important. Um, so anyway, I'll skip over that. Uh, myth seven, that knowledge equals indoctrination. I thought this was a very fascinating quote, back to our Abraham Lincoln versus George Washington. Bias stems from ignorance, not from knowledge. The best defense against bias is not questioning. Our kids are being asked to question stuff, which is good, but you're not going to be able to detect truth in the answers if you don't have a baseline to understand whether that's a valid response or not. So the best defense is knowledge. If you do not know the facts, you will not know if there is anything that needs questioning. Quick uh, experience, my daughter came home and said that somebody in her class uh, had said that uh, Abraham Lincoln, they were studying liberal versus conservative, Abraham Lincoln was a Democrat. My daughter didn't question it because it wasn't there in her, in, in, in her long-term memory. And I said, he wasn't a Democrat, he was a Republican. Now, regardless of what your politics are, Abraham Lincoln was factually a Republican. So, you know, but you, you wouldn't know to question that unless you knew that he was elected as the first Republican. So these are just some examples of the differences in curriculum. Um, Dr. Willingham says that memory, or that, um, memory is the um, residual of thought. And so what we think about becomes our memory, and we do lose some of it, but what you think about is what, is, is what stays in your brain. And so if you think about things that are important, if you think about things that are long-lasting, that is what you have in your brain. If you think about critical thinking, that doesn't help you, but if you think about a problem and try to solve it, that helps you. So here, just run through those really quickly. Um, so just these are the review of them, or maybe this one's kind of interesting. Um, just anything that we do, we should be focused on what are we thinking about. From the idea of doing a PowerPoint presentation on Teddy Roosevelt, if you're spending more time doing the PowerPoint than you are thinking about Teddy Roosevelt, you're learning more about PowerPoint than you are about Teddy Roosevelt. It's just that simple. And so when we're looking at knowledge and what we're doing and what we're learning, we need to be focused on what it is we want to actually walk away with, what is important to think about, and those things that have been important for millennia are still gonna be important 100 years from now, and this is why the emphasis on classics and eternal truth is important. So uh, what can you do? Um, pay attention to what your children are doing in school. Ask them lots and lots and lots of questions. Share this information with at least three neighbors. Um, because you'll find as you talk to them, they have the same concerns, but kind of like Abraham Lincoln was the first president, they're not going to say anything because they don't want to be the only person out there going, I thought it was George Washington. Um, attend your local school board meetings and comment. I can't reinforce this enough. Um, because we get these presentations and everything's wonderful and there's nobody there to say, well, what about this? And so it's, you, it, you know, we're paying for these schools whether you're homeschooling or whether you're you know, private schooling or whether you're in the public education system, you're paying for it and these are your friends and your neighbors, get involved, see what's going on. And remember first and foremost that you as the parent, you are the expert of your child, no one else can know your child better and any program or idea that comes down the pike may or may not work for your child and you're the best person to decide that. 
And that's why one size fits all, the standardization is not ever going to work because we don't have standard children and we were never designed to. Thank you. Ricky Scott? No, the national designer. Oh, yeah, I don't remember his name. his name. Anyways, and he said, well, you can just Google it. As you know, for everything, he's like, well, do you need to remember that? No, you can just Google it. And so that, that thought is so predominant mm -hmm. in people that are out putting together the information for what we're teaching our kids. Yep. Anything? Just for clarification, can you just tell me this look? It's seven myths about education. Here, let me see if I can find, there it is. Daisy Christodoulou is my best guess at pronunciation. And it's really quite short. It might be a hundred and some odd pages. And she goes through and, and says, this is why it's going, this is proof that it's going on. And this is the, the you know, neuroscience behind it. Saw this one first though. So I mean, I see the myths, right? Mm -hmm. But they're also all decent ideas, right? Right. So I think what you said at the beginning, um, I don't know, what's, what's the balance? What do you think the balance is between the, between the two? Because obviously, facts are facts. Right. <laughs> and, and obviously, the world's getting more complex, and you know, higher thinking is just to be, just to be um, emphasized. So. So what's the balance? Well, I guess I don't believe that knowing facts prevents the higher level thinking. I believe it facilitates that. And it's important to understand that the Benjamin Bloom taxonomy, if, where they talk about the higher order thinking skills, he yeah. actually talks about it as the questioning what you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's more of a tearing down institutions. It's more of a political thing than it is educational, I think. And so the emphasis on critical thinking, um, you know, one of my long-term friends has taught for 25 years and she says, we always just called it thinking. It wasn't critical thinking, it was just thinking. Um, but if you, if you have a baseline of understanding, and I think we've heard some of these things that when children are little, they're interested in, in learning about the world and they do that a lot through discovery type things. As you age, um, they do less discovery and more, um, and it goes through the, this in another book, but um, more of the, you know, show you how to do it, back to showing you how to do an algebra problem. You're gonna learn how to do algebra better by having somebody show you and practicing it than you discovering these properties of algebra on your own. But you'd have to have the baseline knowledge of, and memorization in order to understand that. But then once you have that, then when you get into your calculus and your higher level stuff, I believe there are things where the higher level thinking presents itself and comes naturally to you. So it's kind of that you, you build, and I don't think you can, you know, we're, I think we're doing the pendulum thing. We're trying over here and then we're trying over here. And, and again, maybe another example um, that was talked about in one of the books was um, the multiple intelligences. Um, one of the theories is that if you're an auditory learner, you should always learn auditorily. Um, but maybe that's not true for geography. Maybe that's a visual thing. So sometimes the things that we're learning lend themselves to a different way of learning. And we do know that if you see things and hear things coming from multiple directions, that that reinforces those neural pathways that we need. It's just that what I'm seeing in education these days is very focused on we do it this way. And so I think that's, that, that's where I'm coming from is, this is what we're, we're being told, you know, so it's always discovery learning. You never have the teacher up there lecturing to you. And, and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So this is today's problem. 50 years ago, it was probably other side of the coin. So, and you. I'm just gonna add an amen to your, your, <laughs> your points on children learning in a group and having these group projects at an elementary age. Um, I have five children and they were all in a school that was an accelerated classrooms, and they would be put into these groups, and I had 
the gamut of the child that took over the whole project and did all the work, and none of the other kids did, but they all got the same grade, to the one who sat back and didn't do anything or was too shy. Mm -hmm. And I saw it just in my own little family, and I, I so many times went to the teacher and said, please don't make this a project with a group. Please let each child do their own you know, project on their own. And all of them looked at me like I was just the craziest person mm -hmm. because it was so painful for, from a social perspective for my children in elementary age. Now, once they got middle school, high school, that's a different story. Right. They're so insistent, insistent upon doing it in elementary school. Yeah. 